Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Is that your reason? You go to school because it's closer to friends and family. You're going to a school because your, your, your buddies are there. You're going there because you can play a certain sport. Are you there because that's where God wants you to be? Because not only that, you know what God wants you to do. Now let me take some pressure off for a moment. Some of you, like most of us, we didn't know when we were 17 and 18 and 19 what we were to do. But I'm saying right now, your objective is to know what that objective is. And to keep sensing, Lord, what do you want me to do? I don't want to waste a moment in your school of preparation. And that's all you have to do. And I believe that if we trust the Lord with all our heart and we lean on under our understanding, God will direct our what he wants us to accomplish paths. I, I know that with all my heart. It's a promise of him. Now look back over here at Luke 4.43. I know what I came from, I know where I'm going. He says, I must proclaim the good news for I was sent for this purpose. I love that thought. I'm sent for this purpose. If you're in a situation now and you want to know what am I supposed to accomplish, there's a big difference between activity and productivity. And you've heard the illustration. You can be rocking on a rocking chair. There's a lot of activity, but the rocking chair isn't going anywhere forward. So you could be involved in a lot of things. And by doing those things, you're thinking, man, that is really great. But could that activity keep you so busy and distracted that you don't have the energy or the time to slow down, to hear the voice of God, so you can then begin to use less of that activity, but go further, faster into accomplishing what he wants. So the real question is, is what moves me from pure activity into effective productivity? One of those keys is the concept of purpose. What's the purpose? What am I doing? What value am I gaining and, and giving out of this, what I'm doing right now, for the bigger picture what God has called for my life? For some of us, it might mean just for this season, and that season could be, you name the time, to get alone with God and find out who am I, whose am I, and what does he want me to accomplish right now for my future as a leader. Jesus says, I must finish what he's asked me to do. I pray that we'll do that. I want to be busy about my father's business. Going back to the life of Christ for a moment, does anybody know what the first words of Christ were recorded as being said in the Bible? Do you know what his first words were? And then do you know what was in the last little bit of his last words before he, you know, died and resurrected? What, what, what were the bookends of his life? And, and you know what? I, I know he resurrected, so, I, you know, I believe in that. Yeah, all right, okay, let's go back to this. So I look at those and I say, I would like those to be the bookends of my life. And maybe my life is 60. I'm starting now. Your life could be 16 in starting now. But if you want to say the beginning of my life of purpose, then maybe your words would be this, the same words of Christ that are recorded. Not the first words he ever spoke, but the first words that were recorded was this. You ready? I must be about my father's business. Would that be the bookend of your, as a Christian, dedicating your life to the Lord? I must be about my father's business. And what is my father's business? that he wants me in which to participate. All right, discover that, live it, no matter the cost. Then what do you think the last words were? You all know this. Near in the very end, one of the last bit of words is three words. It is what? Finished. And so maybe the bookend of our life will be, I want to do my father's business. And when I'm done, I want to be able to say, one more day, one more hour, one more meeting, one more event, one more book. No, I did what he wanted. This is it. It's over. Okay, it's finished. Now, I know that's a little altruistic, but I think it gives us a target to shoot for. Let's go to principle number three, motivation. <clears throat> the third question would be, do I know who I am trying to please? 
Because once you set the course and you say, I know whose I am, I know I am a Christian, and I know what God wants me to accomplish, now I need to know who am I going to please. Notice what Jesus said in John 5.30. He said this, I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. That's a good, it's a good value to own. I don't come to seek my play, myself, but I want to seek him. You know, in leadership... The very position of leadership, there's a, um, there's what you call a, uh, well, let's just put it this way. There's, there's a part of what you do in leadership that's just a necessary part of the game. And you know what that is? Making decisions. And when you're in leadership and you make a decision, it's not so much, do I want to have pepperoni pizza or mushroom pizza for yourself? But sometimes you're called upon how many pizzas do we order and how many mushrooms do we get and how many pepperoni pizzas do we get for other people. And as soon as you go out and you order that for a big fellowship, people are going to say, where's the cheese pizza? You got too much mushroom pizza. We don't have enough pepperoni. Here's what I'm saying simply. In leadership, once you make crowd A happy, you will make crowd B happy. Do I hear an amen on that? And so then you say, oh, I'll try to make crowd B happy. Now you're trying to make crowd A happy. And you can't do that either. So now you're going to try to do an amalgamation of A and B and get a C. And it just goes on and on from that. I read something recently. I was sharing this with Carol. We had a chuckle this week. And it says this. Leadership is the art of managing disappointment. I didn't write that. But I wish I had. Because that's the case. You answer this call, but not that call. You see this person for an appointment, not that person. You don't show up at this place. It's in leadership. It's not, it's everybody's like that. Just talk to any mother that's out there that's got to deal with kids in the family. It happens to everybody. And so if I could say this to you leaders, as I looked at the life of Christ, I saw two things about him who made tough calls, especially when the rich young ruler came to him and left him. Jesus didn't go out after him. You need to have two T's. You need to have... Tough skin if you're going to be in leadership. Be ready for it. And the second T is you need to have a tender heart. If you could put those two together, that'll be a good balance for you. So let me tell you what not to focus on. Are you ready? Don't focus on the cheers of the people or the jeers of the people. Don't let drive you the pokes of the people or the strokes of the people. Don't let motivate you the compliments of the people or the criticism of the people. In fact, if I could offer you a suggestion so that you don't just come so highfalutin and hoity-toity and um, aloof that I don't listen to anybody, I'm just going to do what I want, I'm, it's all about me. I would say take your cheers and jeers, your pokes and strokes and compliments and criticism and think about chewing gum for a moment. When you pop gum in your mouth, what do you do? You chew it for a while, and then after a while, you take it and you put it on the seat that's in front of you. No, you don't. You get rid of the gum. Listen, listen. You chew it for a while, you get rid of it. You chew the compliment for a while long enough to say, Lord, I want to thank you for whatever you built into my life to make me the way that I was. So maybe I've added some value to that person and they want to say thank you. So Lord, I'm, I'm a Teflon leader. Praise to me goes back up to you. Boy, that's real sweet. Next time a person, same issue, comes against you, pushes back against who you are, I want you to take that for a moment and chew on it because the Lord might be wanting to clarify your message. Maybe you learned a better way to say it, a better time to say it, a better group to say it to. Or maybe you learned better to keep your mouth closed. Maybe it's better for you to rethink it was wrong. But you don't let it drive you into the ground where you just throw your hands up and says, I'm not going to lead any team. No more committees for me. I'm out of here. So you take that like chewing gum. So remember how important it is to see this from a biblical perspective. So much I could say on that, I just don't have time. So the motivation is, like Jesus said in John 17, 4, he said, I brought you, talking to God, glory on earth by completing the work you've done, you've had me to do. Let's go to the fourth one. I'm trying to chop some stuff out here because of our time today, but I think you got the idea. So number four, the principle of collaboration. That's a big word, so I put it in there for you. The principle of collaboration, but there's the question. Do I work within a small group? Because some of you might sense that if you have to be a leader, that you work as a lone ranger. And there are times that you're lonely. There are times that you have got to break the tie. There are times that you have got to launch something. 
Even if it might be a little bit against the flow, knowing that in time God is going to bless it and the whole flow will revert and come back in your direction. But I have to let you know that it still should be done with a small group and a team. And Jesus was our example. In Mark 3 verse 14 it says this, He appointed twelve, designating them as apostles that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. If you will, if this is your Bible, would you circle the word with him, with him? So leadership is often done in the context of a small group. Most of you have sat in some leadership class that I taught and you have heard me say to those that are involved in task orientation, listen carefully, some of us are more hardwired to get tasks done, others are more hardwired, they're very relational. Some people are very active, some people are more passive and shy. None of those are wrong, that's just the way God made us. Now, that being said, let me speak to those of you that are more task oriented. Now, I can speak to me because I tend to be active task, all right? I, I, I'm a task guy. And I struggle sometimes with relationships. I'm grateful for a wife that's high on relationships. She's, she's not here today because she's not feeling well and it's my fault. I was sick earlier in the week. She slept on the couch. Bless her heart, my wife. Did you have the bed? You're sick, honey. She sleeps on the couch. We use separate towels. But I learned now that... <clears throat> We, we can't share the same toothbrush when we're not feeling good. <laughs> I'm joking on that last part, okay. She's relational, I'm not. But now I'm saying this to people like me. How many of you are like me, have the tendency to be more task-oriented than more relational? Would you raise your hand? Thank you, thank you. We, brother, sister, we have to remember that every task is still connected to a human being. And Jesus didn't die for tasks. He died for us and the sin we committed. But he redeemed us, not our boatload of tasks that we've accomplished. So we need a team. But it's also done in the context of perhaps sometimes one-on-one -on -one person. So how do you know if anybody is following you? It says, he who thinketh he leadeth and hath no one following him is only taking a walk. That's another good one. I didn't write it. I liked it. I didn't write it. You know, when we talked about Jesus having a team, sometimes with your team, you're going to get ideas from them. You've perhaps been put into a position uh, formally as the leader, the captain, the coach, the chairperson, however that might be. But then there are times that the team is there to give you insights. And sometimes the team is there not to do anything for you, but just to be there. You remember when Jesus was getting ready to die and he was there and he was weeping and he had all those guys with him in the time of his sorrow. Couldn't you pray? Could you just be there with me? And all of them fled, except Peter. But even then he was so far distant, I wouldn't call him any relational help to Jesus one bit. Now that being said, sometimes as a team... In leadership, we just have to be there for one another. High five one another. They drop the ball. They miss a meeting. They forget to do a call back. That's when you just wrap your arm around them. You sound there for you. I got a call this week from a man who brought a team of people here this last year, Ron, Ron Hughes. He did our big seminar up here, remember, in church on walk through the Bible and all. He's going to come back again in June, bring a team, do another seminar. He, he called me just hours after his dad died. And he said, Stan, my daddy died. He had Alzheimer's. I thought when he'd go, it'd be no big deal, kind of a big relief. He said, I'm not doing good right now. And you know what else? He heads up the Stephen ministry in his church. He's got hundreds, his church is a mega church, hundreds under him just to give care to people who go through grief and suffering. And who does he call? Someone 5,000 miles away. So I said, Ron, I'm not going to give you any sermon. I'm not going to give you any verse. Because everything I tell you, you've already said a hundred times this year alone to people. You know it all. But I'm going to tell you, Ron, I love you. And I believe that you're a man that has a heart turned toward God. And I know that God is going to speak to you in a way he's never spoken to you before when you've got to speak twice at your dad's graveside service and then later a memorial service. We prayed. Let it go. Friday of the graveside service, send an email. I love you. 
Saturday was the service yesterday. This morning I wrote him an email and simply said, we're still praying for you. Now, what did, how did I lead him? I did nothing. I gave him no verses. No, This is how I do my sermons. You know, this is how I did when my dad died. I did none of that stuff. Now, I'm not perfect. But I know that perhaps God might use that to encourage someone. That's a part of leadership too. Just being there. I want to close by giving you a couple of uh, things that, uh, that might help you when someone does come alongside you and that we don't want to have help from other people. And these will go quickly. One reason is because of insecurity and the other is because of pride. We sometimes don't want people to help us as a leader because we have insecurity. We feel like when they come to us to help us that we're, we're no good, we fail them. And uh, that might be the case, folks. Um, but own it and chew on it and receive it. And let me just pause for a moment. Those of you who are so quick to shoot at leaders and tell them how they could do things better, pick your hills to die on, pick your timing, make sure that you say it in the right way. And make sure that he hasn't been overloaded with a lot of criticism yet. And then the second one is going to be the word pride. Be careful of pride. Every soldier needs a battle buddy. And every pilot in the war needs what they call a wingman. You've heard of that. Stu Weber, who teaches men's ministries, and I'm not singling out leaders or only men. Don't go there. But Stu Weber, who does a lot with men's ministries and worship and tremendous stuff like that. He was a Green Beret, actually. And he was asked this question, and I will close with this. His question was this, <clears throat> when you go to battle, who do you want to have in battle with you? And I'm reading this, and I, I'm like, I can't wait to hear his answer. What did he answer? And you know what his answer was? Simply this. I don't care who goes into battle with me, as long as they don't shoot me in the back, you know. I, go into battle with me, as long as they're strong enough to be able to carry me off the battlefield. Did you hear that? And so I'm thinking again about leadership. Are we available to come alongside people? And while we're going to give them value because of we know whose we are and who we are, and we know what we want to really accomplish, and we're motivated with the right reasons because we have purpose and direction, and at the same time we have a team that we're going to be strong enough as a leader to go into battle with anybody for the purpose of not shooting them in the back, but to come alongside them and lift them up to victory so we can go back into the battle again. Well, that's what I'm praying for our church. And I pray that for you and me together. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed. I've only just begun on this. We've got three more points, but there is so much today that we could own. So maybe your question is, is who am I today? Well, first of all, you are a human being. You can say that, can't you? Secondly, who am I? You can say... Humbly and honestly, I'm a sinner. I, I've done things wrong. I, I messed up. I've gotten speeding tickets and spankings. I've had issues in my life. I fail people. I'm not that bad. I've done good stuff too, but I, I know that I'm not as perfect as God. I'm a sinner. I, I know who I am. I'm one who, when I die, I'm not going to go to heaven. I know who I am. I, I'll never be good enough by my good works to go to heaven. I know who I am. I'm one who can never get to heaven apart from Jesus Christ. And I want to be His. I want to know whose I am. He is the strength of my life. I don't want Him to be the strength of my eternal life. And so I'm coming to you, Lord, right now, and I'm trusting you as the one who died and rose again. You'll forgive me of all sin. Your blood cleansed me of everything I've done wrong. And you want to have an eternal relationship with me. And Lord, I need one with you. So Lord, I know who I am. I need you. And I want to be able to say, I know whose I am now because you paid for me with your death on the cross. You bought me. You own me. And Lord, you don't make junk and you won't mess up my life. And whatever I go through here in this life, no matter how bad it gets, I have the assurance that I have eternal life in heaven. Is there anyone in here today that would like to have me pray for you because you're willing to say, I know who I am. I am a sinner, just like you are, Pastor. Thank you for being open about it. But I also want to know whose I am. And so today I know whose I am. I am the Lord because 
I have been born again in his forever family by what he did for me on the cross. Would you pray for me, Pastor? Now, I'll pray for you, but I won't have you stand up to tell me. I won't have you come forward. I won't pray for you by announcing your name or coming to you in this audience. But I'll pray for you. I'm so excited for those who are now ready to say, I know who I am, but I also know whose I am. So is there anyone in here today that by an up of his hand, you just silently let me know that today is the day Jesus Christ is your Savior. And now you're also going to look to him as your Lord. Not to be saved, but because you are. Is there anyone in here today? Put up your hand real quick so I can see it. That's trusting Christ today as your Savior. God bless you. Amen. Anyone else? All right, now for the rest of you for a moment. How many of you, are you sensing that God has placed you in a position of influence and you're not doing a bad job, but you do need a tune-up and you know that Christ is the greatest CEO, the greatest manager, the greatest Lord, the greatest master. In fact, I'll tell you, he's the only one. Everything else is so far down there. It's their man-made, not God-made. And now you want to realign your life to the Lord and you want him to help you become a leader like him. And so you're going you're to humble yourself and you're going to lay yourself open before him. You're going to allow his word to help you and bring, you're going to allow him to bring people into your life and you'll chew on their com comments or compliments. But you really want to be what God wants you to be because you know it's a defining moment. You're going to model it in front of your kids. You've got information to mentor your kids with. Or are you so filled with already arrived attitude that there's nothing you can learn, you don't need any prayer? Now, I know that may put some of you on a guilt trip, and I don't want to do that. But those that are seriously wanting to do that. And you young people, I'm going to be looking at you. But I can only see your hand. God can see your heart. You might say, I'm so puny, I'll never be that global leader you're talking about. That, that's going to be a, a, a miracle. That's going, to be, that's going to be weird. I don't know how that's ever going to happen. Now, good night, that's crazy. I'm just hoping to get through school. i got some work i got to do this afternoon. Forget that for a moment. You have been designed by God in His mind before you're placed in your mama's womb. You are not just another blade of grass on a golf course. You are a human being that's got great purpose and this is a great hour and this is a great church. What does God want you to do? Don't compare yourself with what you could be or won't be. Just say, God, just let me be all I could be that you want me to be. How many of you would like to have prayer now? Put your hands up, whoever you are. My hand is up. i got so much to learn. And perhaps my age now, too much to unlearn. But I want your prayer. Is there anyone? God bless you. Put your hands up now. Anyone? Young people. Father, I thank you that you've allowed us to be influencers of others by the very fact we have been born again into your forever family. And now, Lord, we don't have to have a title or an office I mean, time we walk out in front of people, we are a leader. So as we go, we go truly as a servant leader, but even more than that, we go as a slave leader. We're a slave of yours. Do whatever you want with us, Father. You're the boss. We're nothing. Pay us what you want or don't. But Father, we're giving it all up for you because our faith, as small as it is, we know it's in you. And you're the best thing going. And so, Lord, help us to make sure we don't miss one opportunity of being an influence in the life of another person. And you take us as high as you want us. You put us out in obscurity in some foreign country where hardly anybody knows who we are. But, Lord, the one thing we fear is wasting our life. And we don't want to do that. Father, I thank you for this one that indicated by an uplifted hand they're trusting you. I pray that they would get a Bible and read it that you said that if they believe in you, they could know they have eternal life that they will never perish or be cast out of your life. That they would, Father, at the same time, talk to you in prayer and build a relationship with you through communing with you and conversation throughout the day, every day. I pray that they would meet together with other believers, but Lord, godly believers of influence, faithfully. And that, Father, that they would confess now that they know you as Savior, so it kind of drives it home to remind them that they're here not just to get a to get fat as a Christian spiritually, but to also exercise as a Christian evangelistically in outreach. And Father, help us on our journey now. Bring things into our life that will remind us of our need for these truths. And then, Father, remind us when we've done something right so we can celebrate how good you are and this does really work. 
And so, Father, help us now to be a church that would be a great influence on the island, that we would humbly come alongside anyone else who wants help. Now, Father, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, for your glory. Amen. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.